account-based go-to-market strategy is really trying to bring in more revenue more efficiently than that of what exists today. There could be a variety of different ways, but it's really about bringing in more revenue through a more efficient mechanism. The Industrial Growth Institute podcast connects you with the big thinkers, makers, and subject matter experts across all aspects of an integrated B2B industrial revenue growth function. From strategy, board oversight and transactions, through all the phases of manufacturing marketing, the complexities of industrial sales, and the nuances of marketing and sales technology and customer experience, I speak with guests who bring insights, innovative perspectives, best practices, and twists on traditional approaches. Each episode explores high-level thinking and in-the-weeds actionable tactics. If you enjoyed these discussions, then please help me out by liking and sharing the podcast, and especially by leaving a comment and giving a review. So with no further ado, let's jump into this episode. Welcome to this episode of the Industrial Growth Institute podcast. I'm Ed Marsh, your host, excited to talk today about a topic that's a perfect illustration of the Gartner hype cycle. Not AI, although we'll probably touch on AI, but rather ABM or account-based marketing. Five years ago, ABM was, I think many people considered to be the panacea for everything that ailed B2B marketing and maybe even B2B sales. Then it kind of fell off. Now, after negotiating the trough, I think there are some real practitioners versus, you know, all of the momentum ninja and guru types that used to foam in the mouth about it. And, and some of these people really have the wisdom to make it work. And that describes John Russo. He's wise about ABM. And I'm really excited to have him join us today. John is a three-time global chief marketing officer in successful public and private SaaS companies in Silicon Valley, New York City, and even Luxembourg. So he was an expat, I guess. He has led and experienced three successful exits of market value in excess of $3 billion with private equity stints as head of marketing. Today, he leads a company called B2B Fusion, an agency designed to optimize marketing technologies and business process to drive revenue growth with an expertise in revenue conversion optimization and account-based go-to-market strategies. His agency has hundreds of account-based experiences across high technology, healthcare, and financial service markets. He's a former active duty U.S. Army officer. He earned his MBA from the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley and his Bachelor's of Science in Finance from University of Connecticut. John, welcome to the podcast. Ed, thanks for having me. And uh, by the way, thank you for your service as well. I know you uh, had the service mentioned in there and just want to acknowledge your service as well. But thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. We'll talk about veterans and business and some of the attributes that they bring as, as we go through this conversation. But I have to call you out a little bit to start. I mean, I love talking with other vets and folks with deep practical knowledge about marketing. But of course, both those communities tend to use a lot of acronyms and, and their own language sometimes. So let's decode this, what you might say is encrypted language. What are, I'm going to use air quotes here, revenue conversion optimization and account-based go-to-market strategies? Yeah, great question. And uh, a question that... Um really is at the core of any business right now is getting more revenue in the door. Um, uh, meaning a lot of businesses are challenged to get either net new revenue through new logo acquisition or upsell, cross-sell, even retention. Um, in this environment right now, globally, it's uh, the, the purse strings have tightened. So our team spends a lot of time analyzing how revenue gets into a business and how it can be more efficiently um, passed from perhaps marketing into sales or more efficiently just drawn into the company overall, regardless of the partner um, or channel, if you will. Uh, we're really looking at that efficiency and making sure that that's tracked and trended uh, so people can make business decisions from that point. And how often is it looking at how it enters the business versus thinking about how it should or could enter the business? Yeah, great question. Um, I would say, surprisingly, the majority of times it's the former. It's the former case sure. of um, because people change is hard for a lot of companies in this <laughs> environment, <laughs> right? And especially post COVID, where People are sometimes in the office, not in the office. Very challenging to get change management and to think differently. So I'd say it's more evolutionary than revolutionary. They're, they're evolving how they're getting their revenue, and they're looking a lot at existing paths, 
but they're also considering new paths as well. But there's always seems to be that foot on the accelerator on existing paths because people just don't want to lose that momentum. And at the same time, that proverbial foot on the brake on the new paths in many cases, I think. Yes. Yes. Very All cautious. Right, so five years ago, we were talking about account-based marketing. Now you're talking about account-based go-to-market. Why, why the change? Yeah, and a great question and kind of an evolution. When I started the agency, I wasn't talking at all about account base, but um, came to this realization about seven years ago, actually, when uh, we were starting to see a need for a more tailored outreach and, and kind of an approach from a marketing perspective. Now, if you fast forward, and we've had some experiences, which we'll share a little bit later on, but if you fast forward that to today, now there's all sorts of ways that a company could, in theory, be getting revenue. They could be getting the theoretically through something called product-led growth. So you have the ability to put your product as a free downloadable or free to buy type scenario. You also have partners that play a very significant role in how revenue is sourced. And that can be sell through partners or sell to partners. There's variations of partners. And partners, I think, have increased in terms of their uh, visibility to companies in terms of a path to revenue. So I'd say both of those functions, in addition to either marketing sourced, and you know, for industrial manufacturing, there's probably not a lot of marketing sourced revenue, um, but marketing becomes a pretty critical role. And then the fourth channel is really sales. So sales and marketing is kind of was the thing that kicked off ABM, but now with partners and product led growth and different ways to get that revenue, it's more of in a, a go to market motion um, and less about account based as a function. Okay. All right. So go to market means essentially an integration of marketing and sales. And, and you mentioned industrial. So if we're going to take this conversation. Obviously, we're going to talk in detail about technology, and, and part of my job is to help um, uh, push the dots close together between technology and SaaS and industrial, and, and I think that's something that we can absolutely do. Um, but let's talk for a moment in just a framework of B2B sales as opposed to SaaS sales. Is it fair to say that account-based go-to-market is really maybe what we would call in the old days target account sales, but now integrating marketing with it, or or rather an integration, I guess, based on your firm name, we ought to be talking about a fusion of them. But is that fair that it's target account sales with marketing mixed in? Yeah, I, and I think that is a fair assumption that it, it's kind of uh, reskinning an old cat, so to speak. I'd say one nuance to that would be the technology. So there's newer technologies now that didn't exist two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, that um, really assist in that process. And now with AI, it, it's a whole nother level. Um, but uh, you know, if I were to boil it down, yes, I think you're, you're absolutely right. It, it's, it hasn't changed a whole lot, um, but the technology, and now really marketing has, in theory, the data to understand how to prospect that maybe 10 years ago they didn't. So that should, in theory, help the sales team uh, close more revenue. And, and we'll probably talk more about enablement, but if marketing has the insights on how to prospect, but sales has to execute it, then that's a perfect example of where we need to fuse these two together. And, and, and the term sales enablement often is used to describe the tools and coaching and content that marketing creates and provides to sales, sales to actually help them do that. Is that an important part of what you all work on? A hundred percent important sales enablement. And reason being is all this technology has just, you know, burgeoned here. There's so many logos and so many choices <laughs> in the poor sales enablement function. They're just trying to keep up with their day to day in addition to all the technology and they've got to enable a selling team with this capability. So yeah, we, we definitely see that as a gap and one that we help address um, and it's pretty consistent throughout the industry, in fact. So it's not, um, you know, if, if people have gaps on the sales enablement side, it's not something to be ashamed of. It's just a function of the technology just exploded. And right. the sales enablement people, nobody could keep up with that, uh, you know, at the speed that it's changing. So an important piece is the execution, but in the industrial space, particularly a fundamental precursor is the mindset and the management commitment to integrating the functions. And that's often missing. We kind of have 
the redheaded stepchild is marketing, where there's maybe one and a half people that manage trade shows, make sure the right carpeting and pad is in the booth and run some journal ads, and then a 20 or 30 person sales team. And so there's a big mindset change to overcome that and think of it as an integrated function with some reallocation of resources. Maybe marketing ought to be five people and the sales team 15, because if buyer's journeys are 70% of the way done before buyers want to talk to a rep, marketing has to do a lot more now. Yeah, I would agree. And the, the word I would use is commitment at the executive level, right? And an analogy, the... The, the one that I kind of kid around, the pig or the chicken, who's committed for breakfast um, when, when, when you're having breakfast on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, the pig is really committed. And with ABM, you got to be really committed at an executive level. You can't be a chicken and just say, yeah, we, we kind of, you know, check that box. Yeah, we're doing ABM and, you know, go forth and do great things. It takes <laughs> a lot of energy and effort to pull off an account-based strategy and I call it ABM, it really could be account-based sales, it could be account-based experience. There's a lot of different related names, right. but um, regardless of what you call it, it takes a commitment to do it well um, at the executive level. So I'm glad you brought up the executive part. And we're going to talk in a little while about how that might even mean creating content for a single prospect and for companies that struggle to create content at all, you know, kind of a monthly newsletter sort of a thing, that can be a really daunting Prospect. So whether it's Marcus Sheridan's perspective for executives or what you're going to talk about commitment, that's an important piece. And companies, like you say, ought not entertain this idea if there is an executive sponsorship and commitment. Let's let's talk quickly about um, product-led growth. You mentioned that that's been common in the technology space, and it's hard to find a direct analog in the industrial space. Basically, PLG is you know, uh, Calendly, for instance, Calendly is a great tool that many people use that they can get for free that makes it easy for them to integrate their calendar and send a link to other people to schedule meetings. The idea is that one person falls in love with it. A colleague says, hey, you're using that. Uh, how did you get it? Where did you find it? And before you know it, a department head is saying, we need this for the group. Let's buy a subscription. In the industrial space, they can't just have a million dollar machine for free that gets installed somewhere and everyone falls in love with it. But I think there are analogs that often people don't stop to think about. For instance, what if you have a knowledge base inside your company? Some of it's proprietary, but much of it would be helpful to your customers if you had a service where you could help them set up a knowledge base for them to use internally, perhaps with you know a, a small fee, perhaps not. That can be a great way for prospects and buyers to get to know you independent of the capital equipment that you're selling or a long sell cycle sort of a a, a project. Does, does that fit into ABM potentially as a tactic or is it a separate go-to-market approach? Yeah, it's a, a thoughtful question. And I would probably think of it as an ingredient in the cake, right? There can be lots of ingredients, and the one that you just identified is absolutely, you know, uh, vanilla extract in the cake, so to speak. Uh, you know, not knowing a ton about industrial manufacturing, but knowing a whole lot about account based, if you can simulate your million dollar product or uh, give a test drive around that or uh, provide perhaps an ROI calculator of mm -hmm. how thinking things would be differently. There may be offshoots of technical product-led growth in the traditional SaaS world that could relate to the industrial manufacturing that could help kind of people engage. Because when you think about today's environment, everybody's online. And so the more you can push out online, even though you might have an older school type sales process, the more you can engage people online, the higher likelihood that you're in front of them. Right. Um, so there's probably a handful of ways that you could probably create that perception of a product-led um, right. type capability where you're capturing some of that information, you're capturing contact information, and more importantly, you're capturing engagement. So uh, that engagement could be helpful to your sellers to say, hey, this person's really serious because they're looking at our ROI tool versus somebody who's just kicking tires. Um, but yeah, to long answer to your question, absolutely. There, there's several ingredients in the cake, and I think that could be one of them. Okay, so ingredients we might call tactics. I find this really a fascinating topic because it's at the intersection of strategy and tactics. And, and those terms are often conflated. 
I know that with your military background and 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 also I'm sure your Berkeley MBA, there's a, a very clear line drawn between the two. How would you define the difference between strategy and tactics and 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 how would you contrast them? And then let's talk about ABM and and what that means. Yeah, good question. And let me just ask a clarifying question back. Are are you talking about like from a marketing um from a marketing strategy versus marketing tactics or go to market or how first how you... let's just define the two at a high level and then we'll talk about how it applies to abm okay gotcha yeah i i think um strategically i the, the way i think about it and i kind of dust off my former cmo um, wings would be you have to be more of a business leader at, at that level from a strategy perspective of really trying to understand what's driving revenue, what's driving profitability, um, the speed that it's driving revenue. And you're kind of placing calculated bets uh, at the uh, business level of where do I invest? Allocation, basically. Right, right, exactly. Like, where do, I, where do I invest next? Is it marketing? Is it sales? Is it partners? Is it my product? Um, big, big picture type things. Tactically, I think, you know, we, we began kind of more on the ingredients of how do you reach them? So let's take, for example, um, I guess we're kind of answering your second part of the question, but tactics is to me is more of the, how do I get to that allocation or more could be a little bit more siloed, although I hate the silo approach. Um, you know, how, how are you doing that outreach? Is it through digital ads? Is it through a YouTube channel? Is it through the podcast like you're doing? Is it through the community that you had mentioned? There's a variety of different ways to, to outreach. Those to me are a little bit more tactical. Um, a, a business leader probably cares less about the tactics, more about the outcome. So if the company strategy is to grow 10% with organic growth based on new logos that fit a certain ideal customer profile, let's say privately held 50 to $250 million um, with a uh, current kind of growth posture and a commitment to quality, that would begin to define the strategy for marketing. And then the tactics, for instance, SEO or events would be tailored to support the strategy. Is that fair? I think that's fair. Yes. So when you hear somebody talk about an email strategy, I guess it's possible that you might have that, but generally what you got is people, in my experience, that are expending a lot of hot air that may not necessarily have the understanding of how these complex systems fit together in order to be able to guide an executive management team. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of well-intentioned, um, but uh, I would say uh, examples of Dunning-Kruger that are out there floating around, particularly in the marketing space, because there isn't a clear set of certifications that people can turn to as an imprimatur of, of expertise. To totally. Yeah, I think you're you're 100 percent right. And uh, email to me is an ingredient in the cake. It's right. a tactic. Um, it's how you're you're doing that outreach. And by the way, there are a lot of sophisticated now AI tools that can help uh, accelerate that outreach with a higher probability of success. Um, but to me, that's still a, more at the tactic level than the strategy level. Right. Got it. Let's let's pause for a moment. We've kind of started to dive into account-based stuff, um, but let's zoom back out. I touched on your military service. Uh, thanks for your service. I touched on your CV. In my experience, it's really meaningful for listeners to have the context of a guest's professional journey because that helps to put into a framework the insights that they're hearing and the uh, the, the perspectives that they're getting. So I know the the high points of your career. You were a finance major, then an Army signal officer, and then MBA. And and early, you were early on to the escalator of the go-go days at Frontier Communications. And then three marketing roles before you started your firm back in 2011. But fill in the gaps for us. Give us the color commentary so we know who John is. So when we hear John suggest things, we understand the context where those are coming from. Yeah, yeah, really great question. We could talk about the entire podcast, my favorite subject, me, uh, for the rest of the day. But, uh, um, you know, just um, in a nutshell, you know, I think I was blessed because my mom was an art teacher. And so she had a gene that I never was able to develop. But what I noticed with my mom was she was a teacher. And I look at my dad, who is a systems engineer for IBM, 
and he was very technical. And somehow they blended into John of being uh, technical, yet uh, being able to teach and communicate. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like I got the best of both worlds. Um, if I go way, way back, I was actually born in your backyard in Fall River, Massachusetts, and I've lived in seven different states. So I've lived all over. Um, but um, I started my earlier years. My undergrad was at the University of Connecticut, right down the road from where you are now. And uh, at that time, I had joined ROTC with the idea that they would fund my undergrad because I was the first in my family really to, um, believe it or not, go to a big university. So it was a, a big deal. And we actually won a scholarship based on my performance academically and some of the other extracurricular activities in high school. So basically, my undergrad was paid for. And in return, I owed a little bit of time uh, on the backside. And long story short, I uh, back then you put 10 choices down. And my seventh choice was California. And somehow through the grace of God, I was um, assigned to a unit out in Northern California, not too far from the Bay Area. And I had no idea. I was living in Connecticut. I'm like, oh, California sounds fun. In fact, <laughs> There was, uh, you would probably appreciate this, there was another California destination, Fort Irwin, which was the desert. I had as my third choice because I had no well, idea. I'm like, hey, it's California. <laughs> like, I would love to go to California. And for those who have not spent any time out in Fort Irwin, it is, uh, it's God's country, uh, but it is a desert and there's nothing out there other than a desert. It would have been miserable. So I'm somebody was looking out for me. I don't know who. Uh, but um, I ended up and um, of the Fort Ord near Monterey. I think you're talking exactly. About. Yes, yes. The former Fort Ord. Now it's a university. They did uh, a base consolidation. Um, so I was in Monterey, California, which your listeners may be like, uh, "Wow, that, that sounds like a really elegant uh, place Hot to duty. be." Um, <laughs> and it was. Uh, admittedly, no bad guys hit the beaches in Northern California when I was there. Uh, but um, what I what I liked about California was it just seemed to be a very freeing environment. And I found an opportunity when I, my, I fulfilled my commitment of four years and about the three and a half year mark, I got involved with a company that was doing something very similar to what I was doing in the service. So I think what the service provided was great discipline. Um, really uh, some phenomenal leadership opportunities, leading people of all different ethnicities, different locations. Um, it really forced you to be very people oriented. It was a terrific background and I wouldn't be here today without that service. So I'm grateful for those um, uh, few years. And in between those few years, by the way, long story short, there were two wars. Um, there was Panama and there was Desert Storm. My unit was called, but I was not. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that I spent my time there. Uh, but in today's environment, it's a lot different than what uh, my experience was at that time. Right. Uh, but long story short, I ended up popping out of the service and I found a communications role that leveraged my finance background because I'm, I'm somewhat quantitative and analytical and something that could leverage the communications background that I built in the service it was a company called MFS Communications, where we developed, believe it or not, the first commercial internet infrastructure. And that was uh, too many years ago, uh, but it was a great job. I loved that job. It was in downtown San Jose at the heart of Silicon Valley, Cisco Systems, which uh, back then was just starting off, was a major provider to our network, and we sold a lot of data services. Fast forward, as MFS grew, we ended up hosting content in our data centers. And the content, and you know, uh, one of them gets a little bit of laughs, but um, the first one was USA Today. Um, the second one was Netscape. And the third one was Playboy. And literally, it was the beginning of the commercial internet that our company was founded on. Now, we were selling speeds and feeds back then and decided to spin out the content into a different company. The president of that spin out was a sales leader. 
I was his first hire. I don't know how that happened, but it there was a, a stroke of luck that uh, it happened. So my orientation was very um, kind of sales minded because I always worked for either a sales leader or in a marketing capacity working for a sales leader. So you had to be forward thinking. In fact, coming out of MFS, I was responsible for a lot of the pricing activity, but I fed into the head of sales. Okay. So it was almost like the fox was in charge of the hen house a little bit. Um, but I worked with our uh, sales team on a day-in, day-out basis, and I could get a firsthand appreciation for what they were going through. Fast forward to the content distribution, that company took off. It went from zero to 50 million. We were private. We were, um, this was probably in the late 90s time period. So, you know, you were experiencing the dot-com evolution where all these companies were trying to, no different from AI today, by the way, where they're all yeah, trying to get um, their websites and content online. So we grew like wildfire, zero to 50 million. We had filed to go public. We uh, was the head of marketing for that company, um, and we were small. We were about to go public, and we literally were at a crossroads. And the crossroads were we either go public or we get acquired by a company, Frontier Communications, which you, you had mentioned. Now, Frontier had a lot of the fiber optics that could make our content go even faster. And um, it, kind of another funny story. Somehow I was the contact that they called on Frontier Communications to say, hey, we're interested in buying you. Now, it was not my decision. It was a board of directors, a CEO. Uh, but I remember bringing it to the CEO and he kind of laughed at me. He's like, who's this Frontier Communications? And because I was an East Coast person, I'm like, no, Frontier, like these guys are the real deal. They have 24 right. fibers throughout the US. I think we, you know, I think this is worth taking a look at. Fast forward, they acquired us. Um, I ended up uh, catching some attention from then the CEO, who's Joe Clayton, who is a fantastic sales leader. Uh, rest in peace. He's now passed away. He was a former CEO of RCA. Um, he was a tremendous salesperson. And he, for some reason, I caught his attention. He had me out on Wall Street because Frontier was a public company. He was um, really bullish about the the type of work that we were doing and because i was the head of marketing i was almost like the face of the organization oh exciting the, for for somebody young in their career oh my god it and it was unbelievable some of the things that i got exposed to at such a young age was it was unbelievable and the interesting thing too which is pretty typical in silicon valley when you get acquired most people end up leaving so most of my peers i'd say all of them actually left after a period of time. And as they left, my knowledge actually became more valuable by staying. And uh, I was rewarded handsomely for just staying, even though I was just doing my job. Like I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm doing my job. And they were successful doing other things, the people that transitioned, but I just, I was enjoying myself. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to get this kind of exposure anywhere else. Why would I, why would I go to a startup or go leave? And that's very much the, the culture in Silicon Valley is very startup oriented. Um, so again, fast forward, I got more responsibilities. I was running a very large team uh, for me. It was probably on the order of magnitude of 50 people, um, all in marketing. And then we got acquired by a company called Global Crossing. Um, now, Global Crossing had three different lives. Um, so in the span of literally a year's time period, I've been acquired twice by two public companies after we were private, after literally I started when there was zero revenue and maybe less than a million. So it was just like, whoa, where, like what la la land am I living in here? Um, long story short, uh, Global Crossing had the right ideas. They had fiber throughout the world, but their management team was probably not the most uh, ethical um, at that time. And also, long story short, I had been getting at the time recruited by a company called iPass, which was a SaaS company. And so I ended up leaving after Global Crossing acquired us and the deal went through. I ended up going over to iPass to run their marketing. Now, so you iPass, missed the whole accounting scandal? I kind of, sort of. Um, <laughs> so thankfully, 
I dodged any, like it didn't impact me other than my stock options. And the accounting scandal that you're talking about is they had some irregularities like a lot of companies did back in the early 2000s. Um, and they ended up having to file bankruptcy. And as soon as that happened, the stock was worthless. So um, while I had a lot of stock early on, I wasn't savvy enough to sell my stock like I should have. And, uh, you know, you only make those mistakes once in life. Um, right. So, uh, and I was able to redeem myself somewhat at iPass because that was a private company that went public. But um, very, very fortunate to, to, to kind of make an exit. There were other team members that were a whole lot less fortunate that did get right. caught up in the whole bankruptcy. And it was, it was a nightmare. Now, Global Crossing came out on the other side. I think they eventually got acquired again. Um, by CenturyLink or, you know. So you, you sure. stepped into SaaS when SaaS was just an idea, basically. Uh, totally. In fact, um, the year, so when I started at iPass, we had 50 million in revenue and we went primarily through channel partners. And the idea was to go to enterprise. And so we quadrupled the revenue base in four years from 50 to 200 million from roughly 2001 to 2006 time period. And at that time, we were the third company to go public in 2003. The other company that went public ahead of us was Salesforce.com. So, so it was really, to your point, SaaS was at its very, very early stages. Um, Salesforce was on a similar trajectory, although obviously they're, they're still around. Um, but it was a tremendous opportunity. I was uh, what's called a 16B officer. So I ran marketing, um, but I was kind of the interface to Wall Street because I had that experience when I was 28. Um, wow. So uh, there were only three of us that were authorized to talk to Wall Street. But what that forces you to do with my finance background is you really have to understand the numbers, right? As a business person, you can't be talking about SEO or... Um, how effective the email open rates are. Wall Street only cares about the numbers and you really have to understand those numbers. So three of us, the CEO, CFO, and myself were the only ones authorized to talk with um, analysts, Wall Street analysts. Um, there, were, there were forums that I participated in that were financial related that the CEO wasn't able to do or the CFO wasn't able to do. Um, you know, I was kind of like the third string quarterback, but I did play um, quite a bit in that capacity. Um, again, fast forward, by that time I had, um, uh, my, my children were born and we had a strong desire to return back to the East Coast and was recruited by a GE division uh, which was actually formerly held by RCA. So my old boss, Joe Clayton, actually helped me uh, get the role. And it was a company called SES Communications. And they're one of the two satellite providers globally that provide worldwide satellite. Hmm. And it was a much larger company, uh, 500 million in revenue. And probably, I would guess, like some of your industrial manufacturing audience, it was a company that was a little bit more established. It was a 30-year-old company. It was growing a lot on existing revenue, so not necessarily net new logo, net new logo right. acquisition, and marketing was a new function. Um, I loved that company uh, because it was a lot of what I did back in the service with satellite communication. So it was one for one uh, what we were doing. We were carrying NBC's video broadcast globally. Uh, as an example, we had several clients, the Weather Channel, anything TV related. And we were always toying with the idea of, well, could we, because I had the, the internet background, we're like, could we ever get TV over the internet or over wireless, um, which today is very prevalent. Back in 2008, it was kind of a new you know, a newish thought process. Think about that just 16 years ago. Yeah. When we yeah. talk about what's happened in your world and in your business since you found it in 2011, I'm, I'm sure there's been many, many, many iterations. Oh my God. It, it, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable to, and to know where we are today, like you said, to compare it to, and we were always thinking about it and we were always right. pushing the envelope. The challenge with that business, probably similar to your industrial manufacturing companies is they're big bets. 
So when you put up a satellite in the sky, it's a $250 million bet. So you got to be damn sure the market is ready. It's not the kind of thing, and it was the only profitable, there were only two satellite providers at the time, Intelsat and us, and we were the profitable one. So not only was it a big bet, but you had an extra layer of getting approval authority. Um, anyway, long story short, I ran marketing. I, I, for I, I want to interrupt though and push sure. back a little bit because I think often what you said, the assumptions about industrial manufacturing scared people from doing things. So, mm. so let's say if you're an industrial manufacturer and you're not quite sure how to use content, you're not quite sure what you need to do, but maybe what you do is invest $20,000 in a studio and $75,000 a year in a videographer, video producer who's going to be in your company every day. Okay, so that's going to cost you 125 grand over the course of a year. Is that material? Yes. If you're a $50 million company, can you manage it? Yes, you're going to have to reallocate something. But it's possible to get started in this stuff without huge bet the company kinds of things. Even though it's a radical departure from how you've done in the past, it's not that big a risk. So I would just toss that out there. Yeah, you, you, I think you bring up a really great point there. And I think I was kind of like the canary in the coal mine because they had never had marketing as a function in this uh, company before. And they were really attracted to my Silicon Valley background. So immediately I started inserting uh, technical things into their selling process. One of them, as an example, was like a Wikipedia. Back then, a Wikipedia was important because if somebody was doing a search on right. who is SES and what do they do, Voila, it was the number one at that time search uh, term. So you could kind of craft the direction of your selling process. And I remember getting a lot of pushback right. uh, of you, like we developed it, we created it, we launched it, and people were pushing back. And I think it, it, change is hard. Change is. is hard, which is probably going to be a theme here. Um, but for so speaking, some. Speaking of hard change, why why'd you pull the trigger to start your own business? Oh, good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Um, so I started out of a frustration at the next job. I started at a company called Return Path, where I was head of marketing for Return Path. Great company on email deliverability. But I was frustrated that I was buying all this technology and it wasn't delivering. And so that's when I pulled the trigger and said, you know what? I think I've got a business here. And the business that I was really looking at was doing reporting on behalf of marketers that were struggling with their technical investments. Specifically, they were invested in salesforce.com and systems that tied into Salesforce. And they were having a very difficult time measuring. And so that was really the catalyst of um, starting my own thing. Now, we've been through twists and turns over the last decade plus. But that was really the impetus to kind of start down that path. And so I started in another intersection. You, well, you, you had your finance background. Yes. So you were empathetic to the CFO who was turning to the CMO and says, we're spending money. Are we pissing it away or is it doing something? And the CMO had a gut feeling but couldn't really articulate it. And so between those two, then there was a natural conflict. And you were, if I understand correctly, you saw the opportunity to help bridge that gap by, by codifying data that would help the CMO answer the question and help the CFO be comfortable with the answer. To give you an idea, you're exactly right, Ed. To give you an idea at Return Path, I, I was developing our reporting in spreadsheets. And I remember going to the board of directors and I remember one board member who's a very prominent board member in the SaaS world was saying, oh my God, I've never seen marketing measured. Like, <laughs> like full stop. Like this well, is I mean, a pretty how many times have we heard I'm wasting half my marketing dollars. I just wish I knew which half. I mean, that's that's a prevalent attitude. Yeah, he he was he was blown away. And I remember sharing that with my wife, and she's like, Hey, you got a business here. Like right. you should think about um and that's what eventually happened was I, you know, went off and and went on that journey. Um, and so like in today's world, like fast forward, we really focus on the measurement of what are all these go-to-market motions doing. Are they bringing the revenue at what speed, what velocity, what volume? Um, and we spent a lot of thoughtful time around that, specifically around Salesforce, though. So you, we really specialize in companies that have Salesforce as a CRM, which you know may or may not be your industrial manufacturing segment. Uh, but th there are certain nuances of that system that facilitate reporting. 
And we try to do it all in the system to make it productive for the sellers. That's why right, we- so I, I want a quick timeout and I okay. want to really emphasize a point you just talked about. And that is, you, you, I'm not going to have the words that you used. I didn't write them down, but something about looking at the data, pulling it together, understanding it, rigorously analyzing it, codifying it into an understandable format, all that kind of stuff. And I want to point out one of the things that I really emphasize with industrial manufacturers is they've done that in their business already. They did it 20 years ago in manufacturing and operations. And they've got pro engineer process and continuous improvement at Six Sigma and they track defects and they do all that. For some reason though, on the marketing and sales side, there's a complete contrast. It's much more of an ad hoc freewheeling, let's see what works, do whatever you feel like doing today kind of a world. And the idea that we can bring that same rigor from the back end of the business to the front end that you were talking about is such an enormous opportunity. I just I, I wanted to call that out. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're exactly right. That funny story that the satellite company had two master black belts because it was a former GE company uh, working for me. So I got an appreciation for the Six Sigma side in terms of right. process. Um, but you're 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 100 right, and I. I think the, the thing that gets lost in the reporting and why we go into Salesforce so much is the other element is the productivity of the sales team. So it's somewhat easy to pull the data into like a third party spreadsheet into Excel, which 60% of the market use today and do analysis in Excel. But the challenge that we find is it's not making the sellers any more productive on the insights. Right. So we spend a lot of time thinking about their productivity and how that system can be catered or customized. So not only do you get the reporting, but it's driving the insights to the sellers. That's the missing piece that even my competitors, quite frankly, miss. They talk all about reporting. Um, to me, the reporting is not the end game. I mean, it's helpful, uh, but you got to make sure your sellers are productive because if they're not productive, it doesn't matter what you report on. Um, so we, we, we think a lot about the seller productivity, which is why we focus so much on Salesforce. But again, this topic of sales enablement, you're talking about marketing operations, sales operations, taking this data, these systems, and, and, and presenting a slice that helps the salesperson be efficient and effective. Yes. Yeah, and it's not uh, trivial work, particularly around the data. You know, we because we've rolled around in the data structures with so many different types of companies, we see a lot of common themes, uh, but data is the gas in the engine. And in fact, there was a, a recent survey, I think it just came out yesterday. It's the number one priority for sales and marketers right now is to get more complete data. Um, so data is everything right now. You got to have good data in order to do that reporting. All right. So the current business, it sounds like, is a combination, going back to some of these themes, of strategy, optimizing the funnel, and tactics, kind of the marketing operations piece. Is, is, is that a fair analysis? Yes. Yes, that's exactly and, it. And what would you say people most often get wrong about each of those, optimizing the funnel and the execution tactics and marketing operations? Hmm. Good question. Um... Yeah, really good question about what do they get wrong. So, on the uh, so you said there was two parts on the strategy. What do they get wrong, and, and then what do they get wrong on the tactics? Yep. I, I think the strategy piece that often is missed is probably the productivity side of sales and marketing. Like, I I don't know if people fully realize the decisions that they're making what impact they have on sales and marketing productivity, which in many companies is their revenue oxygen. So let me give you, a, a, for example, they might buy a technology and because it sounds really cool and sounds like it's going to solve a lot of problems, but nobody's been trained on it. Nobody ha knows how to execute on it. It becomes like sand in the uh, gearing of wheel kind of thing. So... Um, strategically, but it's a of one person loved it, and now the team is saddled with it. Typically, right? Yeah, yeah, and it has a dramatic ripple effect on the sales and marketing productivity. And sometimes marketing likes the tool, but sales doesn't. 
Um, you know, you get all sorts of dynamics there. You've got to be really thoughtful about onboarding. The whole onboarding of technology has to be a little bit more strategic than tactical. That's one piece we definitely have seen a miss on. At the tactics level, you know, going back to the data side, and again, we spend a lot of time in data structures and with data providers. There's so many data providers out there that t- today. But I think tactically, um, what's amiss is nobody owns the data. It's kind of owned by sales. It's kind of owned by marketing. Nobody owns it. Everybody owns it. Nothing gets done, and that is at the heart of the sales and marketing productivity. If you've got poor data and you're trying to do outreach or targeting or anything with AI, AI is just going to accelerate your your accident faster. So you got to have the cleaning up data is no fun, and it's a slog, and it's it's a a chore, and everyone hates it. It's a no glory task. Um, In this environment, though, where there's slow growth globally, now's a great time to be looking at it. It's a great, great time to be making sure the foundation is in place. Too many people are focused on the shutters of the house and not enough on the foundation. And that it causes all sorts of problems, billing right. problems, upsell problems. You don't know what your white space is. Um, who do I target? How do I target? Your yep. sellers are kind of going through the morass of their systems, trying to piece all this information together, and they're losing valuable time. Not um, only that, but then they start to question the value of the CRM and then they stop using it. And then they resort yeah. to LinkedIn messaging and other, you know, their Outlook files and other tools. And so then the data just deteriorates faster and further. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I mean, it's a tactic, but it's a really important tactic to 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 get right or right. to spend some time thinking about it because it's going to drive everything else. All right. Um, your California... New York. Um, I know your company has feet in both Nashville and New York. Where do you spend your time? Uh, good question. So we decided because I'm remote, we decided to go to Nashville about two years ago. Um, I could be anywhere as long as I'm near an airport. My team's been remote for over a decade. So we've got wow. 10 people that are global in nature, uh, but I'm really the primary interface. So as long as I'm on a plane or the ability to get on a plane, we're, we're good. Um, at the time when I relocated during COVID, I was spending a lot of money and energy in New Jersey. And I'm like, I'm not seeing any clients. I'm sitting in my basement. I could do this anywhere. And I'd rather do it from a lower cost area where it can pass look that cost benefit to my clients, be a little bit more competitive. Uh, New Jersey was not that location. On the other hand, Nashville is not low cost anymore either. I'm no. 10 years ago it was, but <laughs> not anymore. No, it's okay. uh, the housing everywhere is crazy. Uh uh, but they're they're all the visitors that come in. God bless them because they're paying my state income tax. So uh, <laughs> it's it's also become kind of a hub for marketing and technology. It it, it has in particular. So we've had a, a focus on technology, healthcare, and FinServe. And you may have read the news about Oracle relocating their global headquarters here to Nashville uh, within the last month. So it, it's becoming more of a densely populated technology area, but it's really well known for healthcare and manufacturing. Those are the two primary industries here. Um, and I think that was the major reason why Oracle moved was they they saw the opportunity in healthcare. We see it too. Right. Um, and certainly our proximity to this area has been helpful for our healthcare clients. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think there's an opportunity here. I I find that it's relatively unusual to encounter a military vet in the marketing world, certainly not unheard of. And I've known some through HubSpot and other places. But do do you have any sense of why it's perhaps not as common as finding vets in other places? Yeah, um, (laughs) we could have a whole session on this one. Um, I, I suspect... You know, I go back to my roots with my mom and my dad, my mom being a teacher, my dad being an engineer. I I think I was born for more of a marketing slash selling role. Um, I think a lot of vets, because we're so disciplined and we're so focused and operationally oriented, there's a tendency to either gravitate toward those kind of operational roles, um, of which what I'm doing is somewhat operational too, but there's hardcore operations like FedEx right. or Amazon or bigger companies. I've seen a lot in that direction. Um, I've also seen a lot go into particularly 
our generation of vets did a lot of pharmaceutical sales. Um, so they were in the selling capacity, but they're typically working for bigger companies. And I think because military is kind of more of a straight shooter, get to the point, um, you, you know, you're rewarded for that communication style. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that works really well. A surprising percentage, though, and we've been, you know, in our, our free time, we help uh, veterans, mentor veterans in this area, a surprising number start their own businesses. And I think it's because we've got the discipline. I mean, quite frankly, you, you've got your own business. I've got my own business. Um, so I think there's a, a very large percentage, especially of this generation's uh, military that are coming out saying, hey, look, I can do something on my own. And AI has just made that even easier to do something on your own than maybe five years ago. Um, so I think you're going to see more and more of that starting new business as opposed to working for big co. Yeah, I uh, connected you this morning when I realized you were not connected with a, a, a friend of mine from the vet community, John Panaccione, who has done years of work helping veterans that want to own their own businesses. And, and, and he actually makes the point, yes, you can work for the man. Yes, you can start your own business. But starting your own business is very difficult and it the is. success rate is low. Or you can purchase a business. That could be a franchise or it could be an ongoing business, particularly owned by boomers. As this silver tsunami happens, there's a lot of businesses that are available for sale. Um, so I think you'll enjoy getting to know John a little bit. He'll echo a lot of what you're saying. But talk a little bit more. I know you're still active. You just alluded to it. Still active in the vet community, mentoring. I think you 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 support a program at UConn. It sounds like you do some stuff in Nashville. What exactly are you are you up to in that? Yeah, area? yeah, great question. So I actually have been supporting two schools, um, University of Connecticut, my undergraduate, and St. Joseph's University, a small school outside of Philadelphia. They have this program called Entrepreneur Bootcamp for Veterans, or EBV. Um, I've been a speaker there, so I've shared my lessons learned, mostly, believe it or not, from a selling perspective, but also marketing. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been a speaker, a donor, an advisor. Um, last year, I spent uh, uh, the entire week with the class. So instead of taking vacation, I took my week and I spent it um, you know, really helping veterans start their own businesses and get off to the right start because a lot of, you know, we, we are blessed. Somehow you and I met, I think maybe on a boat trip at a networking event, like we're blessed with a lot of skills that veterans, if they get pointed in the right direction, they'll get there too. But the challenge is they have to be pointed in that right direction. So it's been very fulfilling for me to give back um, in that regard. I've done it for over a decade. Um, at both universities. It's been great. And surprisingly, I've done it a little bit more for St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, mainly because of geography. It was a little bit closer, uh, right. but great people, great university. And um, it's great that both universities support the initiative because it's, it's, it's really something that uh, is important, uh, but not maybe not recognized as important by a lot of other universities. Uh, but with today's GI Bill, uh, there, there's incentives for universities to kind of, um, you know, sponsor that. So that's how I've been helping sure. veterans so far. Got it. Let's kind of circle back to the go to market. And and one of the keys to make that work, I think, is to have clarity into the ideal customer. And so let's talk about ICP, ideal customer profile. When we're developing the plans and approaches to build our account-based um, program on, we have to be clear on the ICP. How do you recommend that companies go about identifying that? Mm, really good question. And it's almost the starting point of any outreach from a sales and marketing perspective. Um, the answer somewhat depends. So it's probably a lot different for industrial manufacturing with an established base versus, say, an upstart. Um, so you know, we could go in both scenarios. An established company probably has customers that they can leverage and they can kind of see who is most likely to buy the characteristics of what that company is. And they could probably do research online, either through LinkedIn Sales Navigator. They could do it through tools like Clay, for example, or Dun & Bradstreet. There are ways to kind of get that total market um, size once you get who it is that you're focused on. Um, there's also qualitative ways too. So we've had some clients that 
really struggle with their ICP. And although I wouldn't say it's our primary service, we've done it as an offshoot. Sometimes they need to have the qualitative conversation of, hey, we think this is who our ICP is. And we had another client where we built dashboards around our hypothesis of the tiers of clients, tier one, tier two, tier three, and other. And in this case, we were getting so many others, we unpacked it, and we found that there was a, an ideal customer profile, and this was for an upstart more than an established company, but we found that financial services was the majority of um, this kind of other category. So that became the ICP once we did the data and the dashboarding and, and realized and unpacked it. So mm -hmm. it became very, very valuable. So there's a lot of ways you can slice and dice it. Unfortunately, it, it somewhat relies a little bit on technology um, to, to, to figure it out and or qualitative conversations or your customer base. <laughs> if, you, if you're in the situation of a, an established company, you probably have 80% of your ICP right in front of you. But often that's just evolved. And your point about qualitative conversations is huge because I see companies make a lot of assumptions about what their ICP is based on what they stumbled into and what just kind of historically has happened. And, and that may well have been the ICP in a different market environment, but now in today and projecting forward five years could be completely different. I mean, for instance, the question of privately held versus public companies as risk aversion grows in publicly held companies. And we see a lot of slowdowns and spending freezes and things like that privately held where you can get to the CEO may well be a really important criteria in the ICP, whereas it hasn't been in the past. Yeah, and a, a good analogy in, in, from our uh, military days is like a sight on a rifle, right? If your sight on the rifle is off, yeah. if your ICP <laughs> is off, right, you're never going to get the revenue. You're going to miss the target by a country mile. Right. And a lot of companies, I mean, we, we didn't talk about this earlier about what's the biggest thing that they miss, but this is probably a number, probably a number two. If you don't spend that time getting that ICP right and getting that sight rifle right, you're never going to hit your target. So uh, this idea of jumping into tactics without thinking about the strategy and building a progressive way is it's, it's so important. I've seen so many companies invest a lot of energy and time and money jumping into tactics and sometimes technology, as you said, without a clear understanding of how it fits together. And then they decide, well, geez, this doesn't work for our industry. Yes. But they didn't do it right. And that's a shame. Yes. Yeah, you're, that's exactly the issue. You've you've summed up my uh, the problem that we solve very succinctly. Is Got it. <laughs> it's so easy for people to do that, um, right. and we're so conditioned, especially in the U.S. We're so conditioned to do it, but it has dramatic implications on productivity when you take that approach. So yeah, right. you're exactly right. All right, so let's recap then. If if you want to do account based, you got to define the ICP really well. You have to be willing to play a long game. I mean, maybe 12 months, maybe your goal would be with, we want to get meetings in this top tier account within the next 12 months, not, you know, we want to get a meeting next week. You have to have the right technology to support and enable and track this. You have to train your sales team to surround the account. That may mean 10 to 15 members of a buying team in each account. You probably have to, I shouldn't say probably, you definitely have to add value to the prospect by talking about their business and their priorities and problems and outcomes and not just vomit up a bunch of crap about what, what you sell. And, and probably most importantly, marketing and sales have to be incredibly tightly linked and collaborative. What am I missing? Yeah, I think um, that's a comprehensive list. The one thing I would add is start small. Uh, and okay. start small meaning you may be able to pick some accounts that – our existing customers that are more likely to take your call, um, build some momentum with something small that's an easier win. I won't say quick win, but an easier win than a cold contact. Too often people want to bite the whole, you know, hey, I want to go run a marathon tomorrow. We'll start with a quarter mile around the lap or do, do a, right. a lap around the track first before <laughs> we do the 26 miles. Right. Um, so start small, get some wins, learn, iterate, pivot, repeat kind of thing until you get to, uh, but all the, everything that you mentioned is exactly right. And, and so between the peak of Gartner's hype cycle, when everyone was 
just foaming in the mouth about ABM and then the trough and now climbing back up. What's the biggest wisdom you think that's developed in the market to help make this practical as opposed to just uh, chitter chatter? Yeah, I think um, it's ABM isn't for everybody. It's not for every situation. Uh, if you're like your industrial manufacturers, based on how you briefly described it, it probably is a very likely uh, scenario. But if complex, you're complex, uh, complex sale, long sale cycle, high dollar volume, firmly entrenched competitors, a lot of resistance to just kind of call somebody up and get a meeting. I mean, th there's a lot of stuff going on. So, so that's a little bit better description. Would you say that it still applies based on that? Yeah, totally. If it, if it were fifty thousand or above on an annual basis in terms of price tag, absolutely. And there's a fixed number of accounts to go after, or their known right. accounts. Yeah, I think they're they're without a doubt. Um, uh, there's an opportunity there. I think that five or six years ago, there were too many people in the industry just kind of beating their chest, just saying, hey, ABM is going to solve world hunger. <laughs> it's, 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 and when you really unpack it, 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 it's really, really good marketing for certain types of companies. Um, and it, it's kind of reskinning, like going back to what you very first said of, hey, isn't this kind of like targeted sales? Right. Um, it kind of is just with technology and in certain use cases. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's not for everybody, uh, but for your segment of your listeners, it likely is uh, something to be considering. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, risk heresy here. Um, we talked about how ABM was overhyped and now there's more wisdom. How about AI? Is AI overhyped? Uh, good question. <laughs> I don't know. I would say it's probably not overhyped. No. Um, this time is actually different. I, I, I think that the accuracy of AI, in my experiences, is a little bit overhyped. Like, I'm, I'm finding it directional. But I think it's going to be a lot like the internet was back in the early 90s, it's going to become the fabric of every business, right? Um, and it, it, there's going to be a bumpy path to getting there, just like when we adopted the commercial internet. There was a bumpy path to get content out on the internet. Um, there's going to be a bumpy path here with AI, with governance and privacy and different countries using it different ways. Um, right. But I, I feel like it's the real deal. Like, I, I think it's just like the internet was back then. Um, uh, will there be some challenges along the way? Absolutely. And, and I think really the accuracy is the biggest thing that I, that I come up with. But again, you got to feed it good information. You got to feed it good data to right. get a chance at getting good data back. Right. Um, that the accuracy to me is the biggest thing that has to improve. Okay. Looking out five years at what we might call go to market best practices, what makes you most nervous about what could go wrong? Hmm. I think, um, yeah, that's a good question, a uh, deep question. I think people underestimating AI as part of their go-to-market strategy would be something I'd be particularly concerned about. I think there, there could be, um, again, with AI, we're not there yet, but I think there could be a, a downward pressure on jobs, right? Because in theory, AI could do a lot. Uh, of heavy lifting that perhaps you don't need a person to go do, but you need a person to kind of point it in the right direction. So it's not like it's going to eliminate people altogether, but I think there could be a lot of pressure to eliminate certain functions. Um, and so that would be kind of the one thing I'd be a little bit concerned about is underestimating what this means to my business. Um, if, especially if I'm an established business or right. if I'm a bigger business. I think the other concern with AI there is you could have an upstart or a competitor go quicker and maybe right. get to your destination. So underestimating that dynamic, I think, would be a big thing. 
Yeah, I think that last point is critical because companies tend to think of their competitors in that list of companies that do the same thing. They don't think of the status quo and they don't think of other potential solutions to the same problem or other approaches. And so um, I think there's a big blind spot and you're absolutely right about that. To me, I think the biggest risk is people discounting actual human to human relationships. Mm. I'm a tech guy. I love True. tech. But I also love being on a factory floor and seeing people work with their hands and being belly button to belly button with people. And I think that we risk um, disregarding the importance of those connections. Yeah, that, that that's a really good one, too. Yeah, it's a question I haven't really thought too much about, but I think you're right. You're, you're probably right on that. Um, and in this post-COVID world, it just seems so strange now. Like I was even communicating earlier today on my, you know, on my phone with... Um, a group locally that I belong to. And I'm like, man, my world is so hybrid now. Like I have my digital right. group on group me and I'm communicating with them. Yet I saw them two nights ago on a, you know, we do like a 20 mile bike ride around here. Um, it's just so hybrid and it's just such a different, like if I were rewinding 20 years ago, you would have none of that digital interface and it just seems so hybrid right now. Right. So that yeah, crazy. So you mentioned biking. I was going to ask you, as an entrepreneur, you carry a lot of stress. Um, I was going to ask what you do to burn that off and, and whether you still run PT every morning. And then I happened to, as I was thinking about that question, I realized, I don't know, maybe the signal core never ran PT every morning. Um, but, but what do you do? And for the listeners, PT is physical uh, conditioning or physical, uh, is it physical therapy or physical training? I don't even know. Physical training. It's training, the army yeah. workout every morning. Well, at Fort Ord, we did it every day. So, uh, uh, and I, I don't do it every day. Day, but uh, I definitely ride. In fact, I was on my Zwift trainer earlier today uh, before the call, which is a trainer for my bike. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of biking. I did my first 100 mile um, event last October. Wow. I did a uh, what they call jack and back uh, 75 miles to and from 75 miles there, 75 miles back on a weekend to Jack Daniels Distillery. So you can imagine halfway through you're drinking and then the next day you have to come back the next day is actually much harder than the first day um, <laughs> i didn't think you could actually drink at the distillery yeah oh yeah 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 you can there's special laws around it like they I see. they have to give you like a special token in order to, to do the drinking so i guess that's another way that i burn off the uh stresses <laughs> through drinking um but uh but that's primarily um it i'm a big sports nut um i've been to six final fours i think Wow. Uh, so yeah, my, my undergrad UConn has been in the news lately in a positive way. So I've been, you know, I, I'm a big fan, both men's and women's for equal opportunity. So I've been to both men's and women's final fours. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I'd say those, those things, in fact, behind me, I don't know where, yep. Yeah, that's a basketball signed by the 2004 men and women's champion, Diane, Diana Tarazi, who's the oldest NBA player right now um and she just had a 30 point game the other night and Emeka okafor who is uh, an nba player um they won 2004 so i won that on an auction in california uh before UConn really became uh meaningful so right um so yeah that that keeps me occupied and then the the rug rats behind me my kids uh they they cause all my gray hair um and, and my wife too so uh or i cause her gray hair i don't know well speaking of gray hair we all have a biggest decision that we made sometime that we thought at the time or shortly thereafter was a colossal mistake, but maybe in retrospect with more time between it actually seems smarter or maybe even brilliant. Um, what, what, what situation did you have like that? Who? Um, I've got a related one. It was actually in the, you would appreciate this in the service. I remember, um, it actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Um, I was in a um, all communications, what's called a battalion. And there were a bunch of us. We all looked the same, acted the same. And within that group, you always wanted to stay there, except supporting people that were down, quote unquote, downrange, infantry or artillery. That was kind of like an unknown path for a lot of signal people. and. When I was asked to make that uh, transition over to artillery, I, like a lot of my peers, fought that tooth and nail. We're like, oh, I don't want to, <laughs> like, I don't want to do that. I want to be with my people. Like, you know, I thought I was highly regarded, 
And it turned out to be the best decision ever. Um, so in that particular environment, I was the residential expert. It's almost kind of like being a, in a consulting capacity now when you come in and you're you're seen differently uh, right. because you're you are the person. And the good news is if things go well, you are the person. The bad news is if things don't go well, you are the person, but you're seen right. as that expert. And I remember how nervous I was and how um, I just had this fearful like image in my mind, like, oh my God, that's a demotion. Or It was the best time that I had in the service. Um, it worked out great. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed the people too. Um, of course, they are in a situation where they were all the same and I was the one odd man. Right. And there were a couple odd people like us that were also there, but for the most part, it was mostly artillery. And I had a lot of exposure to a lot of different people and a different way of thinking and a different way of operating. It was awesome. Right. Uh, it, it, and my boss was, my old commander was over at uh, the artillery unit. So it wasn't like I, wasn't like I was in an unfamiliar territory, but it, it, just the change, like people, you know, we talked about it at the beginning, change can be jarring for a lot of people, including myself. And, and, and this wrestling match between marketing and sales is such a classic symptom of revenue growth dysfunction. But I think that you're talking about an experience that probably was, was uh, fundamental to your ability to see the integration of the two. Yeah. And it's just the change. Like pe people are fearful of change and change actually can be beneficial. You just have to kind of work your way through it right. um, and not make up the boogeyman in your head and, and get through that. And on the other side of that can be very rewarding. And it was in right. that particular case. In, in the marketing and sales world these days, the workload and the necessary tasks are overwhelming. Yes. Um, you know, prospecting, creating content, planning, research, et cetera. How do you advise clients to try to prioritize and how do you structure your own time for maximum efficiency? You know, your daily workflow, your planning interval, whether it's days or weeks or whatever. Yeah, good question. Um, for everybody's stressed right now and nobody's got a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> which And nobody's got the answer. Yeah, it, it's kind of a nightmare scenario. Uh, and, and budgets are really tight too. So, um, y y you know, the... The thing that I try to do is be as available as I can, especially for existing clients, um, either via Slack or um, other other alternatives. I'm on text basis with a lot of my CMO clients. Uh, you know, if they ever need something, I try to be as responsive as humanly possible because uh, they're just they're just in such a predicament right now. Um, I feel for them. Uh, you know, I think it's a much different environment than when I was an operator. Right. where you, you got to do this more with less and pull rabbits out of your hat um, that are really challenging to to provide. Um, I also try to provide them and even my prospects too with a lot of value in terms of insights uh, because I talk with so many people. And again, you know, we talked about how you and I are blessed with networks and I talk to so many people. Um, so if I can share some of that wisdom or knowledge, I do it on LinkedIn. I would encourage people to follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I give, I give everything away. Like I just give everything away just because I, I want to be helpful. Um, is I that know right? you also do that through a group called Pavilion. I, I talked to Kathleen Booth a few weeks ago. She was on a recent episode speaking about the value of community. Yes. Um, and, and community is really important. I think to reach prospects because I mean, that's the point she makes that nobody wants to get cold emails or cold calls anymore. I mean, they still work. It's still important to do, but community is a shortcut to that. But community also is a great, learning and teaching opportunity, which I think is where, where I see you watching your posts seems to be a lot of what you do in Pavilion. Talk, talk a bit about community. Yeah, I, I, I've tried to do that uh, with Pavilion and even on LinkedIn. And we run a weekly uh, vlog. I've been running it for two years. I've had over 200 videos on best practices around sales, marketing, go-to-market expertise. I'm always looking for speakers too. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I think it's whether it's an established community. So the pavilion community is an established community, typically for sales and marketing, a little orients a little bit more toward sales and a little bit more toward technology. Right. Um, but there you've got everybody on Slack, sharing ideas, sharing concepts. Um, I wish I had my own Slack community. I, I, you know, I think it's something I aspire to, but in the meantime, what I've been able to do is just kind of bring people through my LinkedIn journey 
And for people that are on LinkedIn that find it valuable, I'm sure they're tuning in, whether it be to my vlog or, or my content. And if they're not, they're just scrolling on to something else. So um, I think the underlying thing with community is you got to have good content, really relevant content. And that's what we try to produce. And it would be no different from your industrial manufacturers like, that are prospecting. You got to get some great content, great thought leadership. But great content means about them, about their problems, about their goals, about their customers and their customers' customers, and not about what you make and sell. You know, I'll say time and time and time again. Yeah, exactly. Everything hinges on that content, and and you could build, you know, your own industry, and maybe you're doing that now. Uh, great content wins the day. So you've got to have that great content. And that's why I try to give, and I probably do it to a fault. I've had a couple of people say, man, I can't believe you're sharing that. Um, uh, but, you know, it's it, it's a way to kind of keep in touch with people. Right. And, and for those that are stuck with the do more, more with less, like they could learn a lot of what I'm sharing if they take the time. Some people don't have the time. Some people don't have the capacity, which is understandable. That's when they engage with us. Right. Um, events, I think, are a type of content that people don't stop to think about that goes back to that human connection, being in front of people, getting people's undivided attention, bringing experts together, sharing insights. Do you see events as a tool that fits into the account-based go-to-market approach? Yeah. So events, I feel like, have morphed pre-COVID to post-COVID. And what I'm seeing with events right now is you got to have some goes back to content. You, you better have a damn good agenda and a damn good reason to get people out of their office, out of their homes, spending time, potentially money on a flight or hotel. But it's, it's an investment now. Whereas the bar wasn't like that pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, I felt like it was anything goes kind of thing. Right. Now, post-COVID, if you don't have all that ticked and tied, you know the the big mega events in particular, I think, are are suffering from that. And what we're seeing in the industry of technology is a little spin off events or very focused, very targeted, um, high level executive events. To answer yeah, so, your question, though, so it's part ABM. Like bringing a group of executives together for a dinner, right? Or bringing people in for a day where where you know in the in the machinery space, a lot of my clients work with food. And so in food, the ability to track and trace by organic origin or lots or ingredients to meet FDA requirements, those are really important but horizontal topics that people need to know about. And so best practice is if you had an event in your facility, not self-serving, talking about what you do, but around the topic like that, and then people just enjoy the environment and learn more about what you do as well. But you're the catalyst that brings these people together to help them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I would say being in Nashville, it's a, um, I don't know about for industrial manufacturing, but a lot of events come through here. And that's how I've actually connected with some of my prospects. Some of, like a lot of people are coming through here because it's like an attraction. Uh, the content, right, right, of singing and fun and uh, music, it's attractive to people and they can get their content. So, uh, I'd say events definitely play a role, but you just have to be more thoughtful about them. Speaking of Nashville, my youngest went to Vandy, and, and we used to often fly out of Boston on Thursday afternoons, fly back on Sunday evenings, and we'd see a lot of uh, wedding parties, bachelorette parties, whatever, that would be heading out full of energy and giggling and exciting and 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 well turned out and looking forward to the weekend and coming back Sunday looking rather tired and bedraggled. So I know there's a lot of that kind of activity in Nashville. hundred percent, hundred percent. Vanderbilt is an excellent school. Not that I'm probably telling you something you don't already know, but it's an excellent, excellent school. And he did um, ROTC there as all three of my boys at ROTC where they went. So, so good experiences for them. Interesting. Um, so you're a great source of info and a lot of people learn from you, but where do you turn? To learn what what groups or books or podcasts or YouTube channels do you think would be helpful? Not perhaps the 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 finer points of ABM that you might be diving into, but for folks in an industrial space looking for a high level understanding, where would you recommend they turn? I would be tuned into the Marketing AI Institute. Paul Redinger, I think, I kept, yeah, I'm mispronouncing his last name, but uh, his podcast is excellent. Um, 
of course, we mentioned Pavilion as a community for sales and marketing. For anybody, go to market strategy. That's been helpful. Um, and LinkedIn. I mean, I can't believe LinkedIn to me is probably bigger than those other two because people are sharing all the time on LinkedIn. A little right. less so on Twitter, um, although I've made some amazing connections on Twitter uh, of people that I wouldn't ordinarily have run across. Um, but I'd say LinkedIn has been for for my industry in particular. Now, would industrial manufacturers hang out on LinkedIn? Maybe, maybe not uh, to the same degree as perhaps the sales and marketing. But I, I, I've been pretty pretty pleased with what I've been able to learn and pick up there. Um, and occasionally a little bit on YouTube, but a little less so. And that's just more generic. Like if I have a specific question, I can just search around and find something. But LinkedIn to me has been a gold mine. Got it. You're obviously expert at really complex marketing implementations. You see things and pull things together in ways that other people struggle to do. But what's something that somewhere from, from elsewhere in your personal or professional life that you've put a lot of effort into trying to get better at and you just, you're not very good at? Hmm. Um, definitely the art. Like uh, my daughter went to art school and she's a graphic designer, actually currently looking for a full-time gig. She just finished up college. Um, my mom's an art teacher. I did not get the art gene. I got the, <laughs> the numbers and the quantifiable. And, you know, no matter how hard I, I try, John can't paint between the lines or John's just not great at, at uh, being an artist. Um, I'm creative. Like I can get creative solutions, which has been helpful, but I, I don't have the full skill set that uh, my mom or my daughter uh, both have. Um, I can I can empathize. I, I wanted to be an architect because of that combination of engineering and science and rigor with design huh. um in the end my life took a different direction but but i feel that same way sometimes like fonts i am color whatever the analog is to color blindness with fonts i can look at something and i can react to it oh that looks good or that looks stupid but i could not tell you let's you try this font or let's find something that looks like that it just doesn't not the way my mind works Exactly. Um, so you mentioned LinkedIn, people that want to connect with you, learn more, possibly even find out about working with you. What do you recommend? How's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, LinkedIn is probably the best way. You can either follow or connect. Um, uh, I offer both those choices up. I think I've got 8,000 followers or something like that on LinkedIn. Um, but uh, that's probably the, the best way and where I share the most amount of information. When I do my weekly videos, um, I do them every Friday at uh, 11 o'clock Eastern for 30 minutes on LinkedIn, but it also gets broadcast over to YouTube. So if you did a B2B Fusion uh, YouTube search, you could subscribe to those videos. And if you had any specific questions that you're looking to get answered, rather than sifting through all 200, I'm happy to point you to, hey, you ought to talk, you know, this is the one that would be worth your 20 minutes or 15 minutes or or whatever. Um, the videos cool. are, are quick. Uh, we, we typically do them 30 minutes in duration. Um, I'm in the process of summarizing the majority of them. So um, the older ones should have show notes and chapters and the whole nine yards. So to help speed up if, if you've got a specific question. But I'd say either LinkedIn or YouTube would probably be the best two places to connect. Good. And don't forget on LinkedIn you could, or on YouTube, rather, you can watch it one and a half or 1.7 speed. Um, it's true. Which, which I find really helpful. That's a good point. That's a really good point. All right, John, this has been fabulous. Um, you've you've brought a lot of information. I think um, we've put it into a context that makes sense for people that don't, don't live in a tech and SaaS world. We've talked account-based go-to-market at a high level um, and, and, and how it might fit for other companies in that have complex, long sell cycles, high tickets. But... Wrap it up for us. Give us the final word on on kind of this account based approach and what the value is. Yeah, it's really account based go to market strategy is really trying to bring in more revenue more efficiently than that of what exists today. And it could be a direct, it could be through your channel partners, it could be through upsell, cross sell. Um, there could be a variety of different ways, but it's really about bringing in more revenue through a more efficient mechanism. Cool. Great wrap up. 
thank you for your time. Thanks for your insights. Thanks for the wisdom and the and the the tour of your career that brought you to this point. Well, I'm grateful for the thoughtful questions. You really had had had, had me thinking there. I'm like, oh, I'd never thought about that. Uh, so thanks for uh, uh, having me on. And uh, yeah, it was a ton of fun. My pleasure. All right. For everyone listening, don't forget, you got to hit the bell, like this, share this, comment, subscribe, share this episode with people you think might be frustrated with the way they're going to market right now and might be interested in a, in a fresh way of looking at it. Appreciate everyone joining us and listening. Thanks very much.